California Endowment. Alex's bio is so interesting. She has gone from youth development work in the D.C. area to the Alameda County Public Health Department, where she oversaw policy change in criminal justice, economics, education, housing, land use, and transportation. And now Alex's role at the California Endowment includes working with building healthy communities, including initiatives related to displacement and gentrification, criminal justice reform, and governing for racial equity. Next, we will hear from Gilda Haas, an organizer, an educator, and an urban planner who has been helping grassroots organizations build economies from the ground up for 30 years. She was the founding executive director of Strategic Actions for a Just Economy. Gilda taught economic development at UCA, UCLA for many years and is now on the Antioch University faculty. And she is currently facilitating the co-design of a communication strategy on gentrification and displacement for the California Endowment grantees. And third, we are very fortunate to have Don Phillips here today. He is the co-director of programs at Casa Justa, Just Cause, and is the executive director of the Right to the City Alliance, an organization both Gilda and Don have been leaders in. Don leads the local, regional, and national policy campaign work for Casa Justa, Just Cause, and was the lead author on their report, Development Without Displacement, Resisting Gentrification in the Bay Area. Alex will kick us off, and then uh, we'll uh, do a wrap-up for us at the very end after we hear from Gilda and Don. And what we'd also like to do is hold questions um, until the end of all the presentations, unless uh, you have a desperate need for a clarifying question to be answered. Um, so now it is my great pleasure to welcome Alexandra Desatel. Hi, great. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to make sure you can hear me. Um, and uh, I am really delighted to be here this afternoon uh, to talk about the California Endowment's um, support for power building as a focused strategy for creating healthier communities and as part of that preventing displacement. Um, so the California Endowment is here. There we go. The California Endowment's main uh, project right now is called Building Healthy Communities. It's a $1 billion, 10-year initiative with investments in 14 places across the state, as well as a focus in um, po uh, policy and advocacy work uh, that links the places and goes beyond our places statewide. And we really focus on policy and systems change. Our mission is to expand access to affordable quality health care for underserved individuals and communities and to promote fundamental improvements in the health status of all Californians. And we don't focus on prescription. We really like to focus on um, fixing broken systems and outdated policies and ensuring the balance of power is with the people. Um, so a lot of times we get questions of why place? Why are you focused on place? Um, so just as a very quick background for people who are not familiar with the impacts of place on health, where a person lives really is determining their access to safety, food, housing, jobs, all of those different factors that create um, the odds for health. And so we found through research, and our, and our initiative is designed through this, um, that your zip code is more important than your genetic code. And that's really the, behind the focus on place here in the Building Healthy Communities Initiative. Um, you know, the opportunities for health are very different when you're in a neighborhood like this versus like this, where there's bike paths and uh, access to uh, services and grocery stores, or where the businesses are unavailable, the infrastructure is crumbling, the schools are um, not there. Where your grocery stores look like this or like that where parks look like this, or are next to environmental hazards, or just generally uninviting and falling apart. So a lot of times when we talk about gentrification and displacement, people uh, think, well, you have place, you're a place-based initiative. It really must um, 
be a boon when there's new capital coming into a place for help. And on the surface, that's true. Um, you know, uh, place-based investing is really intended to attract new capital, public, private, grants and, and loans into places suffering from long-term disinvestment and all the health and social social problems that go with the lack of investment, like access to good schools, safe parks, health leagues, and good sustaining jobs, and the list goes on. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, capital flowing into neglected urban communities is much more compli um, complicated. People often like to frame the gentrification debate as pro or against development. So if you're not for the building that you see on your screen right now, you must be for this. And, the, and unfortunately, framing the gentrification debate it just in this way is very misguided. It's really not about whether or not people want to have investment in the community. I would say that there's not any any residents that we work with across all of the building healthy community sites that do not want to see greater investments and resources and in coming into their community. It's really just about um, doing development rights, the people and places now being a targeted for infusions of private capital, the people who are the very cultural fabric of the neighborhoods get a say in how development happens um, and are supported through policy and otherwise to stay in place. So just really quickly on the health impacts of, um, of displacement. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to have a quick slide and I'm, I'm sure John will go more into this, but um, you know, we know that gentrification is real, uh, jet displacement is real, and so um, I just wanted to make that statement before going into the health impacts of this. Uh, there's been lots of studies. This is one um, that Causa Gusta did in the Bay Area. There's others in LA and across the country really documenting that displacement as a result of gentrification is a real thing. So there are real health consequences. I like to share this ad. This was from, taken from a BART station in Oakland several years ago. Um, when people have asked me, well, what, you know, if there's, if there, there's improvements in the community, that must be good for health. And I like to show this, this ad that I saw in the BART station because it really illustrates that, you know, if Burger King can understand <laughs> the health implications of um, gentrification displacement, we all should be able to. This really just says, you know, as, as rents are going up, people have less money for the things that they need to survive. So what are the um, health costs of displacement? Um, as housing goes up, over, over, displaced gentrification and more pressure on a neighborhood can increase the housing costs in overcrowding. As people are displaced, it increases commute times. You have breaking of social bonds and loss of social capital, of social support, and then access for, um, to basic necessities goes down. Transit services, food, um, health and human services. All of that takes a toll on health. Um, exposing people to, to um, more substandard living conditions, people forced to make unhealthy choices, um, like the Burger King um, dollar menu, poor air quality, and really the two that I want to um, emphasize that are often under, um, un under talked about is really just the stress that comes with it, and related to that, the trauma related to serial displacement. This wave of gentrification that we're talking about right now and experiencing in so many places um, is connected to centuries of displacement um, of uh, people of color in this country, and it's um, and that stress over generations wears people down. Just a really quick um, comment on stress because I think sometimes people can um, can associate stress or um, assume that stress uh, around an issue like this, like housing pressures, is the same as stress, for instance, if you're preparing for a test. It's, it's really, really different. Um, the stress that we're talking about is it's the difference between revving your engine versus driving at a steady pace over time. Revving your engine is going to burn it out much more quickly, and that's the kind of stress that we're talking about. Um, it increases your allostatic load, elevating your cortisol, and, and over time just diminishing how long you're going to live. It's, it's, um, Stress is a word we all use, but it's quite serious for health. So what do we do about it? And what I'm, I'm going to turn it over to um, Johnny Gilda in just a minute to really go into those solutions. But from the California Endowment's perspective, the solutions, there are lots of things that we could and should be doing at a policy and systems change level that are the responsibility of, of, our, of our collective to really protect and stabilize people living in communities. 
Um, but it's not just about those policy changes. It's about how they are made and really about shifting power. The um, diagram that you see up there on the screen right now comes from a convening we had last uh, July um, with a number of funders really um, learning from our partners in the, um, on the ground about uh, the key strategies for preventing gentrification and displacement. And, and the real emphasis is on um, with every decision that you're making, you're really trying to change the balance of power. Um, and just to kind of go emphasize this point one more time, I just want to look uh, very quickly at, you know, how we see um, structuralized racism playing out in our communities um, a long time ago and now. And so what you can see on your screen is the cor a court case around um, racialized covenants in the Bay Area. And really it was looking into whether or not people were able to put into their um, deeds restrictions on who could live in the house based on race. And as we all know, that along with uh, uh, racialized covenants along with redlining, and this is a map of redlining in um, Oakland, uh, California, um, were both outlawed um, in, uh, during the civil rights movement. And yet we know that the same types of um, outcomes that, we, that were seen um, back then when these practices were legal, we still see today. In fact, a recent report from the Green Lining Institute found that black and Latino residents make up 56% of Oakland's total population but receive just 10% of the total dollars lent by the major banks for home purchases. That kind, of, uh, that kind of disparity is not by accident, it is structural. And, um, and we, we um, argue that unless you actually shift power so that the people making decisions um, are the people most impacted by these problems, even if you have policies and systems changes, you are not going to see this, the structural shifts that we need to ensure that there's healthier, more inclusive, and stable communities for, for all people, not just for some. So with that, I have the extreme pleasure of um, turning it over to Gilda and then Dawn. I am lucky to work in this organization, the California Endowment, that um, supports their incredible work um, as leaders in, in California and across the nation. Um, we are very happy to be working with um, Gilda on some very important work around narrative change and working with our, um, our partners, uh, especially in Southern California, about really thinking about the intersections uh, to this work um, around gentrification and displacement and how, to, and how to really build a stronger narrative um, around uh, uh, equitable and inclusive communities. And then uh, after that, Dawn, who's been a longtime partner, um, a longtime partner with um, the East Oakland Building Healthy Communities effort, and um, and uh, um, and uh, really just helping us develop this work statewide. Thank you, Alex, for sharing that incredibly important work of the California Endowment. Um, before I turn it over to Gilda, uh, David Fukuzawa had a very um, helpful comment that I just wanted to read to you um, once we pull it up. Uh, okay, David's comment is, uh, uh, Matthew Desmond uh, in his new book argues that eviction is to low-income women as incarceration is to men. That is a powerful correlation and um, really um, creates a, a strong image and message uh, in, in my mind. Thank you, David, for, <coughs> for sharing that. Um, now, uh, let me turn it over to Gilda Haas, who among many important roles in her um, career has been a mentor and coach uh, for the next generation of leaders for a new economy, and um, thank you for that, Gilda. I, I just think um, um, helping the younger generation into our work is um, incredibly valuable. Thank you for that. Welcome, Gilda. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, hi, nice people. Um, good morning or afternoon, and. Um, I hope what I have to say will add some value to your busy day. 
And so what I decided to do today was to um, tell a few stories about the idea and the reality of resilience as a way to get to what gentrification and displacement have to do with health in the most conventional and also in the most systemic understandings of that word. So in science, resilience signifies the amount of change that a system can undergo, its capacity to absorb disturbance or disruption. And um, as a lot of you know, for the past 40 years, scientists have been studying the resilience of ecosystems. It's a, resilience is a key concept in the urban sustainability program where I teach. And I also think the same concept lies beneath the recent recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatrics that all pediatricians should screen for poverty. Their purpose here is to reduce poverty's lifetime health impacts, to reduce its attack on resilience. So in my own community organizing and research and development work, I've spent the last few decades working with others not only to combat the destructive impacts that land use and development policies and practices have had on the resilience of our communities, our families, and our children, but to also produce system interventions that help manufacture resilience. So I'm going to start out by telling you a different kind of story about how we work to undermine the resilience of an intransigent large slumlord to protect the health of thousands of children and their families in LA. So here's the situation. Between 2002 and 2005, land use decisions and real estate investments caused property values and rents to skyrocket in an area where I used to work. This community was once considered part of South Central Los Angeles, but by this point it had been reclaimed and renamed by large property owners, developers, and public officials and became known as the Figaro Corridor. And so while this might be counterintuitive, this spike in land values produced a slum housing epidemic in the community. Professional slumlords who we had been fighting for years, wanting to cash in on the boom, stopped making any repairs at all because why, why do anything when hopefully the building would sell for a really high price and probably get torn down at the end of the day. They began to harass tenants even more than usual and began initiating even more than usual illegal evictions because an empty building is worth a lot more on the speculative market. So we responded with tenant organizing and tenant rights education. We work closely with legal services because 90% of even illegal evictions are effective if the tenant doesn't have legal representation because the landlords always do. We worked on policy campaigns to protect tenant rights and protect and improve whatever affordable housing we had left. But things were moving really fast and we needed to be more strategic. We needed to have a bigger impact. And so we decided that it was important for us to help our city attorney recognize that big slumlords weren't incompetents. They weren't just incompetent landlords, that they were rather a form of organized crime that relied on networks of managers and money and legal constructs, and that to protect neighborhood health, we needed to understand those systems. We needed to intervene strategically, and we needed to help the city to take those criminals down. So we started doing research to identify the largest slumlords and found a couple that owned hundreds of buildings, one whose name was McHugh, owned so many that we started to call his holdings McHughville because the tenant population approximated the size of a small town. So here's a map of another slumlord's family's holdings. Um, we teamed up with Valdis Krebs, who's a well-known social network analyst, to learn how to construct and map and analyze their network of relationships. And so the, if you could see the black line, um, that represents the financing of their slum system. Um, the yellow boxes are individual buildings that are legally held by numerous um, limited liability corporations, which are the blue boxes, and the purple boxes are, are human beings. They're people in, in, in this family and in, in, in their relationships. So, so when we mapped, Yet in the social network software, we looked for vulnerabilities and could see that this system wasn't resilient. It was in fact vulnerable because all of the financial relationships 
we're in a starburst formation and I'm putting these pink dots in there so it's easy for you to see these centers of these starbursts. With a, so they all have a particular actor in the center um, and the actor is, is generally the same person. So that was a clue. If we focused on that actor, a lot of pressure on that actor and took them out, the whole machine could fall apart. Um, so we supplied the city attorney with evidence and data, and please know that I'm leaving out a lot of the details, um, and, so, and so many other people who contributed. But the punchline was that by disrupting the system, due to its vulnerable design, we were able to win. So why am I telling you this story? Because our approach to analyzing networks isn't just about destruction. Most of the time, our work is about construction. That is what organizing is about. That is what community organizations and institutions are about. They are about building and protecting resilience. So if you were a family in the Figueroa Corridor, you were likely connected to families and friends who could help you out from time to time to watch your kids, to celebrate your successes, to connect you to information. You were also likely connected to churches, um, to schools, and to community organizations like SAGE or Casa Justa. And so if you were a church or a community organization in the Figueroa Quarter, you were likely connected to the Figueroa Quarter Coalition. And our interconnected organizations work to strengthen the relationships that benefit community health. So poor tenants find a voice and common cause against slumlords through our tenant organizers at SAGE. And if they don't have one, they're connected to a medical home at St. John's, often through Esperanza's health promoters. And while it's true that together tenants, health promoters, organizers, and medical professionals might compile evidence that can be used in a criminal slumlord cases, more often than not, our collaboration produces positive relationships of mutual aid and support that makes the vulnerable less vulnerable, that makes the community stronger and healthier. So the fact that you have family and friends nearby, the fact that you have relationships with local institutions that have your best interests at heart, the fact that you have a medical home, the fact that you know your children's teachers and childcare workers, all of these things add to your resilience. So what do you think happens when those connections are severed, not once, but multiple times in a lifetime, in a decade, or even in a year? People lose those relationships. They lose their medical home. Their children might start at a new school, perhaps not for the first time this year. Moving is expensive, and it adds insult to injury to poor folks. It's hard to ever catch up, and that is when resiliency is undermined and displacement becomes not just a product of poverty, but in fact, a cause. And then the associated health costs that so concern the American Academy of Pediatricians truly sets in. There are a lot of things that we can do to strengthen the health and resiliency of our communities, and it certainly helps to understand the root causes of displacement. It is not about hipsters or boutiques or bike lanes. It's about expulsion. And there are ways to prevent that. So here are some things that I think we need to address and that I think we can address. As the gentleman suggested before, we have to prevent evictions. In the introduction to his excellent book, Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City, sociologist Matthew Desmond writes this, fewer and fewer families can afford a roof over their head. This is among the most urgent and pressing issues facing America today, and acknowledging the breadth and depth of the problem changes the way we look at poverty. For decades, we focused mainly on jobs, public assistance, and mass incarceration. No one can possibly deny the importance of these issues, but something fundamental is missing. We have failed to fully appreciate how deeply housing is implicated in the creation of poverty. Not everyone living in a distressed neighborhood is associated with gang members, parole officers, employers, social workers, or pastors, but nearly all of them have a landlord. So this illustrates the purpose of my earlier story. If we are trying to fix a system, 
we have to look at its significant relationships. And I cannot tell you enough how significant the relationship between working class and poor people and their landlord is. When people are forced to move, which is what eviction is, it takes a terrible toll. We must protect tenants. We must reduce evictions. Evictions in the United States are currently at an epidemic scale. I want you to know that this is not a market failure. It is a very serious failure of society, and we just need to step up. Okay, secondly, um, we have to work against real estate speculation. There are ways to reduce, deter, and undermine real estate speculation, which is effectively what turns gentrification into expulsion. Increasing tenants' rights and protections, requiring replacement housing for housing that is lost, regarding our city's housing research and plans, which are the basis for receiving federal money as actual indicators of need and following up on that, there are ways to do that. We can all benefit if we take significant amounts of property off the speculative market. Now, how we do that would, would probably require another webinar or two. But in the meantime, if you want to read a prescient story about Wall Street's new speculative adventures in rental housing, check out Right to the City's report, The Rise of the Corporate Landlord. But while I'm on the topic, I'll just have an aside about another one of my obsessions, the fact that more and more of our housing is consolidated in fewer and fewer hands and that in many neighborhoods like the Figueroa Corridor around the country is absentee owned makes our neighborhoods very vulnerable to becoming less than a community. And a lot of our jobs reflect the same structural attributes, absentee owned, untethered to community, with ownership consolidated in fewer and fewer hands, which is why I am an evangelist for worker-owned cooperatives, and so now you know my secret. No business that is owned by its workers have ever moved to Mexico or Arizona to get cheaper wages because they, those are their wages, and they're much less likely to pollute their own communities, to pollute their own backyards. And then finally, if I have it made this obvious, we really have to invest in organizing. We have to build resilient networks of relationships, mutual aid, and deep democratic methods and understandings. It makes a difference. For example, um, uh, my partner, um, St. John's Will Child and Family Centers, has satellite clinics in neighborhoods that are rich in organization like the Figueroa Quarter, where we have coalitions, community organizations, collaborations, and memberships. They also have clinics in communities that are organization poor, where organizing is sparse, and their executive director, um, Jim Manja, has told me that the difference in how much it takes to produce health in those contexts is tangible and measurable. We have to support the existing organizations that are good at building resilience. We have to build, also build resilience where there is none. And so I'm going to stop here. You've heard my decades-long commitments and obsessions, and of course the devil's in the details, and I imagine that's what um, the Q&A is for. Thank you so much, Gilda, for your um, excellent thoughts and, and, and your storyline. Um, I, I learned a lot about resilience and uh, disruption and construction. Um, and I really thank you for your um, your work and your uh, the way in which you send your message. Um, You're welcome. It is now my pleasure to turn o it over to Don Phillips. Um, he is an organizer, uh, an author, uh, and an articulate leader on fundamental change. Welcome, Don. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy, I'm having trouble seeing my slides. Is there something I should um, I should be doing? Let's see, we see you. we are seeing your slides. Well, we're seeing a beautiful mountaintop, which I suspect is your screensaver. Would you? Um, maybe, I see. Um, there you go. Yep. Okay. Give me one second while I work out the. Um, Great. Yeah. There you go. Does that work? It is excellent. Perfect, Don. 
Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, um, and good morning, everyone. Um, I am Dawn Phillips, and I have a dual role and function. I am the co-director of programs at a Bay Area community organization called Casa Justa Just Cause, and I also have the honor and pleasure of being the executive director at um, Right to the City, which is a national alliance. Um, just to, hmm. I'm sorry, um, Michelle or Nancy, can you tell me how I um, advance my slide? Try page down or an arrow down. Hmm. Like you have a map. Okay. Can, can we I see. Um, let's see. Don, I think you're presenting from your 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 um, computer, so you just advance like you would on your computer. I know, it's not allowing me to do so. Okay, hang on one second, but, everyone, I'm sorry. That's okay, for me the space bar didn't work, but the arrow keys did. Yeah, you see the faint arrows down at the bottom? Yeah, um, it wasn't allowing me to use my arrows. Give me one second and um. Okay, thank you. Hey, space bar worked hey, for me, no. Alex. Um, so, um, very briefly on the two organizations, so Casa Justa is a community-based membership organization in the Bay Area of California. Um, our work is focused on issues of gentrification, displacement, equitable development, housing and, housing and immigrant rights, and we are working primarily with black and Latino communities. A lot of the work includes um, a range of approaches uh, from service provision to policy advocacy to organizing and leadership development. For Right to the City, um, we are a national alliance of over 50 member organizations in 33 cities and we've come together to stop displacement of low-income communities of color as well as other vulnerable populations from historic urban neighborhoods on a national level. Three years ago, the Alliance helped found and anchor the National Homes for All campaign, which aims to build a tenants, housing, and land justice movement through linking, coordinating, and scaling up the work of local organizations. The campaign has three major tracks of work, tenant protections, equitable development, and expanding community land and housing trust. Um, we've also had some recent national successes in terms of supporting the work to increase the uh, National uh, Housing Trust, um, which we are very happy with. And there are currently about 60 groups from 30 cities involved in the Hopes for All campaign, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. So one thing that we have found extremely helpful, um, and folks are going to see, Alex and I actually have some slides in common. This must be a sign of how closely we've worked together, um, but Alex, you're going to, we're going to see some, we're going to show some of the same slides, maybe make some different points, but, um, but something that we found extremely helpful in our local work is um, that there actually is a benefit and a need um, oftentimes to define what we mean when we talk about gentrification. And the reason for this is that um, there's a, a great deal of contention um, especially around policymakers and to some extent even the media and other kind of stakeholders as to whether to, as to what it is and whether or not it's happening. So we have a, a definition which I'm not going to read in its entirety but it's essentially a definition that centers on three points. Um, one is that um, gentrification happens in neighborhoods with a history of disinvestment and abandonment um, secondly, that it's driven by private interests, private capital. Um, and third, that it's supported and facilitated by our government, government policies, government funding, etc. And um, for us, um, and here's a kind of a more of a visual representation of that, of that def definition, for us, understanding these three root causes are really the key to then figuring out what it is that we can and should be doing about it. 
So Alex has already highlighted this, but part of this um, uh, kind of clarification of the definition and kind of actually um, being able to describe exactly how and if gentrification is happening. Based on uh, big data and housing, yes. Yes. We just Nancy. We just cut out for a second there, Donna. What you on your audio? Okay. You're back. I'm back. Okay. So I was I was saying that we built on work that was uh, developed by Lisa K. Bates, an academic and organizer in Portland, um, but using demographic and housing market data, we basically were able to chart and map where neighborhoods are um, from early phase to ongoing and late phase gentrification. And this is the map that Alex showed um, that uh, in partnership with the Alameda County Public Health Department, Casa Justa, this is, appears in Casa Justa's report um, on gentrification. And you see uh, here the different stages that neighborhoods are at. And part of why this is so important is really the punchline that gentrification is not a process that just happens. It's a process built over decades, um, many, many decades, and it is uh, constructed and brought about by policies, funding, by, by uh, decisions of uh, policymakers and, and public agencies. And so in as much as gentrification has been created, um, there can be and must be something that has to be done about it to Gilda's point. And Alex and I both love this slide. Um, and part of what it is that you know I think um, that that we feel is that uh, there cannot be healthy communities while there is a situation in which folks are having to choose between housing quality and stability and health quality and stability, right? And so um, in as much as Burger King gets it, so must we, to Alex's point. So what is the approach? Um, and this, so this is getting into some of the terrain that Gilda was starting to build out for us. Um, what is the approach to actually pushing back against gentrification and actually creating healthy, sustainable, resilient um, communities? Uh, for both Right to the City and Casa Justa, the answer really lies in housing in that we believe that housing is a central ingredient and a critical starting point to any other forms of healthy, sustainable, and resilient communities. Um, so there's a big, um, uh, there's a big um, uh, development that we feel housing work has to respond to, which is that nationally, we are becoming more and more a majority renter nation, right? So what this slide um, from the right to, this, uh, right to the City's rent, Rise of the Renter Nation report is stating is that there are going to be 4.7 million new renters in the next decade. Half of them will be seniors, and the vast majority will be people of color. And so for us, if housing is a central feature of healthy, resilient, stable communities, um, then strategies and approaches that deal with tenants, tenant rights, tenant protections, and renter issues have to be then the core and the starting point of that strategy. There are, as many of you know, a range of issues facing low-income or working-class tenants. Um, affordability is one of the central ones. Um, this is documenting the extreme unaffordable uh, uh, crisis, un the crisis of unaffordability that we're 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 seeing nationally right now, um, with over 21 million households. Um, paying 30% of their income, uh, more than 30% of their income for rent, 
and over 11 million people paying over half of their income. Um, so affordability, for example, is a severe um, issue. Um, other issues include um, uh, health, uh, healthy conditions or unhealthy conditions. So we organize a lot here in the Bay around um, healthy housing issues, the fact that there is mold, lead, um, you know, lack of repairs and severe habitability issues that we're seeing in a lot of the, especially housing stock in many kind of core um, older urban cities. So these are, you know, these are some of the things. The, the, the current, um, the current, uh, um, the current thinking is that the way to solve the housing crisis is to actually try to attempt to produce more new housing. And what I have here is a slide that I think is for us of, of very much an indicator of how that's not really um, the, the best approach or an approach that's going to get us to where we want to go because as you see, and this is, this is a slide about Bay Area numbers, but this is very similar and indicative to what's happening nationally, is that production is a very poor way for meeting housing need and housing demand, um, especially at lower levels of income. So the Bay, like many places around the country, um, has much more uh, production at higher levels of income of housing, but much less at lower. So for us, this is really an indication that the focus on tenant protections and, 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 and tenant rights um, is, is really a strategy to actually provide housing stability um, and community stability for the vast majority of folks in the country. So building on what Gilda said, um, talk four key strategies that we would say in terms of what needs to happen. So firstly, um, organizing impacted residents, and, and Gilda talked a lot about this. Um, part of the work of Right to the City is that all the organizations in the Alliance are deeply engaged in impact in organizing impacted folks. Um, and, and for us, um, organizing folks to know their rights, to exercise their rights, to protect those rights, and to expand on those rights um, in their neighborhoods, in their communities, for their families, and for their for their neighbor neighborhoods, are act is actually a central uh, component of a sustainable and healthy community. Right. So there is no way to um, get to health healthy outcomes without organizing and organizing impacted folks. Secondly, there has to be clear strategies towards stabilizing impacted residents. Uh, so here I've described, this, described it as winning healthy and affordable housing for tenants in particular, but for everyone in the community. Um, an example of some of what is happening around this is that um, right to the city groups in Boston, for example, are, are pushing uh, a, a, a nationally recognized uh, campaign to pass just cause. Um, both at the at the city and at the state level, um, here in Oakland, there is uh, work happening this year to strengthen um, rent stabilization, and in the Bay Area, there are going to be anywhere from six to eight jurisdictions attempting to pass rent control in the fall of this year. So what we're seeing is all over the country, folks are pushing on um, expanding rent control um, where it exists. Um, institutionalizing it where it doesn't, um, winning just cause, which is speaking to Gilda's point of how you, prote uh, you protect and prevent from evictions, um, and essentially seeing these tenant protections and tenant rights as being central to a stabilization um, strategy for impacted low-income working class folks. Third, once we're able to stabilize residents, it actually sets the pathway for those residents, residents to actually be engaged in the conversation about how should their communities be developed. So to Alex's earlier point, that in all the communities that we are organizing and working with, folks are both interested and excited to see communities uh, improve through investments. However, we're very clear that um, in order for that investment um, to be meaningful, it has to primarily serve the long-time 
uh, vulnerable residents who are in that neighborhood first and foremost. And we think this is a win-win approach to development because um, what, what do long-time and vulnerable residents want? They need affordable, healthy housing. They need good transit systems. They need um, good schools. They need a good public infrastructure. They need um, access, access to healthy and uh, affordable foods. These are things that are across the board needs of any sustainable, healthy, resilient community. So the idea of stabilizing residents to then put them in a position to be able to deeply engage, lead, and participate in um, conversations about how their communities develop is, is a very important um, kind of trajectory to how we build, the, build out these types of communities. And then lastly, our, our groups nationally are engaged in, um, uh, in expanding community ownership of housing and land. And the idea behind this is that, as Gilda and Alex has both, have both said, um, solely relying on the private market um, as a way to provide housing for folks is actually not a healthy and sustainable model. So we, in fact, do need to build alternative models that actually put ownership of land and housing back in the hands of, of, of community folks. So in places like Detroit, um, uh, um, folks are building and expanding land trusts. Folks are figuring, how, figuring out how to, in some ways, um, capture uh, foreclosed properties, um, put them in community trusts, and ensure that these properties in the housing are protected um, for kind of long-term affordability, long-term ownership, et cetera. So um, I think that in uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, where I would kind of end on is this idea that, you know, um, there is a tremendous amount of energy and all the kind of cutting its cutting edge solutions and, and, and strategies, in many ways, our, our belief is that that is happening at, in, 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 at the local level, it, at, the, at the level of neighborhood organizing, at the level of city organizing, at the level of regional organizing. And that if we want to see these shifts on the national level, really what's going to need to happen is a deep investment in that local work, um, and which is why the alliance is investing so heavily in this strategy of what we call translocal organizing, which is lifting up, aligning, sharpening, and resourcing local work so that we can and will have impact and scale at the larger level, at the state level, and at the national. So um, this is a little bit of a, of a twist um, in terms of how, how we think about moving the dial nationally um, with, in some ways, less of a focus strictly and solely of what's happening in DC or or at the at the kind of level at the level of the federal but really looking at in some ways lifting up and having um, national impact and national change be driven at the local um, and I'll stop there Don thank you for uh, for really inspiring us with your work at Casa Justa and um, for uh, Making the important distinction, I think that um, you know investment, as I hear you, is not the problem, but that investment to be helpful um, and enduring must serve the long time and vulnerable residents of of the communities that the investment is being made in, and. Um, and a call for a return to rent control, um, which uh, you know, back in the 70s, uh, we saw so much destruction um, when rent control was eliminated in many, you know, large eastern cities. Um, so thank you, Don. Um, now I'd like to circle back to Alex um, to speak for a couple minutes about. Um, uh, you know what? What Alex said early, earlier that the California endowment um, focuses on fixing broken systems and outdated policies, and ensuring the balance of power is with the people. Um, and, and I think uh, Alex is going to um, make a couple suggestions to funders in the audience about what they can do too to 
um, to uh, invest in strategies that encourage healthy communities um, and discourage displacement and gentrification. So, Alex, I'll turn it to you. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, and I think that Gilda and Don probably said it much better than I will, but so I'll be very quick so that uh, we can get to the question and answer period. This is just our Building Healthy Communities theory of change, and since I knew that there would be a lot of funders on the call, I thought that I would share this. Um, Really, you know, we, as I said before, we really focus on um, building capacity to drive change, and, and um, we do that through our drivers of change, which I will discuss, and investing in our drivers of change, which I will discuss in just a second. And we believe that through those investments, we will be able to see the kinds of policies and systems changes that, at a very structural level, will change um, and reorient our government systems to prioritize the health of um, communities that have been um, too long neglected um, at best and at best at worst. Um, and that, that, that those policies and systems changes will lead to um, environmental, political, social, and economic changes that will improve health and well-being for all people. <clears throat> we believe that inequity, or not just we believe, we know that inequity actually um, draw, brings down the health of, of all people, not just those who are suffering. Um, so now I'll just spend a few seconds talking about our, dri our drivers of change. Our, we have five drivers of change um, in building healthy communities, and those are building people power, building youth leadership, development, and organizing, supporting enhanced um, collaboration, kind of somewhat like collective impact for people who are familiar with that, um, for policy and systems change. Leveraging partnerships, we're really working with other um, uh, public and private systems, uh, making small investments, and supporting efforts like um, what Gail, we're working with Gilda on in terms of changing the narrative, really shifting the dominant public views about it in this year. Um, so people power, I'm not going to read through this, but our goals are just really to support resident organizing um, and uh, for, for our systems changes, and that in that organizing, we also often emphasize in, in many of our places a lot of work that um, that builds resilience, like Gilda was talking about, that deals with trauma and builds resilience, and that um, prepares people to engage um, across m many different issues and um, and uh, and um, races and uh, geographies. So that's really one of the ways that we prioritize some of our grant investments here. And then the same thing with youth leadership and organizing. Um, recognizing that um, not only will you be the decision makers of the future, but that their um, ideas and energy are so critical to realizing the, the future that we all want to see. Um, so what can funders do? Um, this is a very long list, but I'll go through it quickly. Um, the first thing is I think that you know um, one of the big barriers I see when I talk to people about this issue is that often people say, oh, it's just too big, or neighborhood change is inevitable or things like that, and, and I think that that mentality is, is a really huge barrier. This is just too big for us to take on. I don't think that it's it's, it's a very, um, you know, it, putting ourselves in the in um, the position of people impacted, we, we can't say that. We can't say it's too big. It's not a matter of if it's happening or if it's too big um, or if it would happen anyways. It's, how? How are we going to stop this and really build and support the organizations and people um, uh, making the changes that will create more inclusive, healthier, sustainable communities for everybody? Um, and so really, you know, kind of getting over that first barrier, so almost like a barrier, is really going into um, a lot of what Gilda and, and Don were talking about, which is really just funding the grassroots power building. The solutions that they're talking about are um, are brilliant because of how they arrived at them, and uh, that the process and the engagement and the deep thinking that goes into this, it can't be um, skipped over, and it can't happen without um, the kind of organizing that that um, Gilda and Dawn described. And so this is really about, um, you know, trying to shift from from a, um, a more consistent focus on specific policies. Um, and the promotion of specific policies to really focusing on prioritizing long-term movement building across intersectional issues. The communities that we're talking about are, are impacted by lots of the different movements. Um, and so really just supporting that long-term, deep 
um, and kind of building work is, is critical. Um, and then I just want to highlight that that you know a lot of times um, it it can be especially when um, when funders don't necessarily have as uh, many or long term relationships with grassroots um, groups. Sometimes the solution is to uh, put the money in through intermediaries, and I just want to emphasize that from our experience. Um, and you know, it, um, this is not to say that we've you know cracked the nut on all the solutions that um, are all kind of all the funder you know ideas that I'm, I'm putting here. California Down is still learning and growing in these areas too. But really, that just want to say that um, putting money through intermediaries and intermediaries play a very important role, but that is not the same as directly funding grassroots power building, and that it's really important to um, directly invest in the organizational capacity and, and infrastructure um, to do this work over the long haul, because um, it is not the, the work is not limited to one policy or another. It is, it is um, it's very long well generational work, and we need all strong organizations that receive direct investment. Um, Another part is really just taking back the narrative that um, it's not the pro, it's not pro or against development. It's development without displacement, and it's really just um, thinking about all of the different you know. And, and Gil to go into this much more educated way than I can. But I, in preparing for this, I was thinking about some of the conversations that I've had recently about well, isn't it you know just um, we need we just need more housing overall, and and you know I think that again it's like the that um, Maybe at a theoretical level would work, but in, in the actual work in the actual um, world, when you don't have necessarily as much housing supply at all levels as would be needed to stabilize a community, you can't make an assumption that increased supply would lift all boats. Um, and so, really challenging some of these dominant narratives, um, and that the the role of government is really to benefit to ensure that the benefits accrued through some, through the commodification of something as important as housing, um, are balanced against the good of collective. You know, we have a very strong narrative around private property rights here in this country, and really um, we have to balance uh, that and, and the policy making that we do against um, the good of collective. And really I think a lot of this comes down to who, who matters and who doesn't in, in our society. And really just um, as uh, John Powell um, talks about a lot broadening that circle of uh, human concern. That um, if, if we, like going back to my first point, it's not if we can take a stand against displacement, it's how. You know, um, making sure that we think about who is in that circle of human concern because the answers in, in the, that we seek will really be driven by, by who we think matters. And then finally, just, you know, um, experimenting with with um, using our power beyond grant dollars, if there are ways to, like I said, change the narrative, which um, it goes to just how we, we as um, funders speak about the issues, is a power beyond our grant dollar. Um, you know, using our influence on this issue is critical. So, and with that, I will stop. Thank you, Alex. Um, and, and thank you for the California Endowment's um, critically important investment in in, in this work. Um, I, in a minute, I'm going to open up uh, to, to your sending in questions or comments. Um, we actually have a couple in the queue already. Um, but as, as you in the audience are framing your questions, I just want to thank the speakers again for uh, your terrific and thoughtful presentations. Alex, Gilda, and Dawn um, have all contributed a large amount of time to prepare for these presentations, um, talking with each other, um, and giving, uh, get, actually giving these impressive presentations. And so I, I want to thank each of them for donating their time and their, um, their smart and dedication to this uh, part of our series on gentrification. Um, so with that, um, we have uh, we have a question from uh, David Fukuzawa um, from Kresge, which is a uh, incredibly valuable and important funder for the funders forum to happen. So thank you, David, for for your tremendous support. Um, um, his question, which came in before we heard um, a little bit from Dawn about um, about her uh, top four strategies. Um, so perhaps 
the speakers can expand upon that. Um, David's question is, what are effective strategies to mitigate displacement and expand social and economic opportunity and health at the same time? Um, and um, so uh, can, uh, do we have uh, any further thoughts from our three speakers on that question? And, and um, I'm wondering a little Nancy, bit more maybe about the, go ahead, Don. No, you should finish. I'm just wondering a little bit more specifics perhaps on your Oakland ballot initiative. Yes. So um, a couple of things. Um, one, one way that I would answer it is there are multiple of our groups um, nationally who are approaching the kind of strategy question from a kind of a, a couple of different um, angles that I think all that I think are all equally important. So, firstly, there is a great need to respond to the the crisis as it's occurring immediately, and the crisis for uh, low-income folks looks like, as Gilda said, evictions. It looks like um, folks being either explicitly ev evicted because they've gotten an eviction notice or implicitly you know, displaced because the conditions are so poor that folks have to make decisions as to whether or not to continue to keep their children in a, in a dwelling that has no running water or no bathroom or no kitchen or no heat for months um, and sometimes years on end. Um, we work with folks uh, who are living in situations where the roof has caved in or there is wall-to-wall -wall mold. Um, so, so there are a whole range of immediate emergency factors facing, facing folks around their housing on the ground. There is a, tr a track of work that many of our groups do that is about that, right, that looks like um, uh, some form of direct service work. Um, some of it is um, what we call um, rights-based work in that it's getting groups of folks together, explaining their rights, helping organize tenants in a building to, to kind of confront their landlord. But there's a, a, a first piece of work is you have to actually help people deal with the crisis and the conditions that they're working with ser through services, through counseling, through exercising their rights through um, confronting their landlords, right? That's one. Secondly, there's the policy work, which, you know, that's what the fights around rent control, that's what the fights around eviction protections look like. And the policy work happens, is happening in two ways right now. In, in one way, um, there is a way uh, nationally of folks attempting to pass um, legislation at the ballot. And the context for passing legislation at the ballot is usually in a situation when, when folks feel that the local conditions do not allow them to pass the level of necessary policy change through um, you know, their city councils, through their board of supervisors, through, through legislation, then you have to go to the ballot. Then the other method is to attempt to pass it through, through, through legislation. And those are really, really critical because then that begins to produce protections and a shift for many people, right, in the, in the thousands and in the ten thousands and in the hundreds of thousands and in the millions to some extent, depending on how large your municipality is. And then the, the third piece is um, um, it's really critical to begin to build alternatives, right, which is which Gilda talked about, which is how do we actually begin to re-envision what housing looks like. So, so, so to David's question, I would say um, there has to be a clear understanding that there has to be both investment and work that is moving and, and you need all three components to actually be able to, to, to produce the results that you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, uh, another question uh, came in from Merith Ash. 
uh, with Change Lab Solutions. Um, and um, her question, I think, builds on David's, um, uh, and it is addressed to Don. Can Don address strategies for overcoming state level preemption of strong local rent control laws via vacancy decontrol laws? How can we organize tenants statewide? Yeah, and, and Gilda can probably weigh in on some of this. So, I, I mean, you know, there's no simple answer. Um, I think if there's one, pun one punchline is to all these questions, it's organize, organize, organize. So we are, you know, we're attempting to build from the local to the national, and the state is definitely a key um, piece, key side of that struggle. Um, we, there have been multiple efforts to um, change the state level pre, uh, pre uh, preemptions, which in particular in places like California are very, very, um, uh, uh, are huge barriers to actually strengthening eviction control, uh, rent control, et cetera, at the local level. So, you know, I, I, I could talk for a long time about it, but I won't. I just have, I'll just say that we have to support local organizing because on the foundation of local organizing comes strong regional organizing mm -hmm. and from the foundation of strong regional organizing comes strong state level organizing and from the that basis comes uh, national change you know and we strongly believe this that's why um, we have this translocal approach which says that um, we the national work is only as strong as the local place-based work and vice versa so um, we are building out that vision in California. We're working across the regions, um, you know, uh, Northern California, Southern California, for example, and this is happening nationally where people are actually um, working both at the local, from the local to the state level. Th th thank you, Don. Um, Gilda, uh, did you want to, to add to that? Oh, uh, well, I mean, organize, organize, organize is, is first, but um, I mean, there, there isn't much to add to that, that of what Don said. Um, there were actions to create laws that preempt stuff. We have to build the power that will allow us to win, to remove those, um, the, the, that legislation. Um, and. Uh, I think it's good that people have been building. I think it's an amazing moment, um, particularly in the Homes for All campaign and in Right to the City, where um, organizations from around the country, organizations that don't necessarily even have staff or funding, organizations from Kansas, organizations all over the place, which you wouldn't expect, um, are Grand dealing Rapids, with the fact that... I, I, I was informed by the Grand staff Rapids, now Michigan. I'm Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yep. Yeah, that, that they're dealing with the fact that people can't afford their housing. And so I think we build a base. I think all of the things that um, Alex was talking about in terms of, um, or John Powell was talking about, in terms of building a bigger we, um, in terms of narrative, in terms of moral imperative, and in terms of strategy are, are all things that we can do. And then in answer to um, David's question, I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of, um, and I think there's a lot of benefit from changing the terms of engagement between owners and renters. Um, I told you a story about criminal slumlords. I don't, you know, they're a minority. They just happen to own thousands of units in Los Angeles taking advantage of the housing crisis. But most landlords aren't criminals. Um, but if we change, the relationship between landlord and owner by um, mediating um, that relationship to protect the resilience of, of the majority renter population, then we will also be changing who goes into this business. It will be people who are happy with modest profits. They're people who are happy and proud of delivering a good product to people. Um, and I also think that we can also take a much 
more strenuous, rigorous look at our land use policies and be careful how we assume, as, as people have mentioned, that um, more is better. If, if more isn't serving um, anyone in particular, it's not better. And then finally, um, we really have to get out of the belief and the habit of privatizing public stuff. Once we let it go, it's really, really hard to get it back. It's, you know, the, the Figueroa quarter wasn't always 90% absentee owned, and that's really a problem. It's really a problem across the country. Uh, thank you, Gilda. Um, I, I want to um, ask the three speakers um, to provide a closing comment, if you would. Um, but while you're while you're thinking about what last message you would like to leave with the participants on the webinar, um, we have a question from Dr. Pamela Shaheen asking um, where uh, people can obtain a copy of the rise of the corporate landlord. Okay, that's easy on the Right to the City um, website, righttothecity.org. The, the righttothecity.org. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gilda. Um, so uh, could, could, could we start with you, Alex, um, just uh, a final comment uh, that you'd like to leave with the audience? Yeah, sure. I would just say um, thank you to um, you for hosting this webinar on this really urgent issue and to everyone who tuned in. We really appreciate um, your sharing your afternoon with us and I hope that you found some of it, um, what I shared useful. And also to Gilda and Dawn, and um, Dawn in particular, you've taught me so much, and it is funny that we did have <laughs> similar thought pattern in, in our uh, in our presentation. So I just I really appreciate all of the collaboration that we've had over the years. Um, and I guess I would just say that you know I'm you know a lot of what we presented in particular, what the funders can do, is still stuff that I'm learning and thinking about, and we are internally at the California Endowment, and so I invite others who are having similar. Um, thoughts and conversations and struggles about how to how to support um, this important um, uh, organizing work around gentrification and displacement. Um, to please reach out to me. I'm 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 always looking for other people to think this through with. And um, also that we are working right now. We have an effort going um, through the neighborhood funders group to bring together different uh, 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 California and national funders who are funding in California to really think about uh, aligned strategies um, for supporting um, work around organizing uh, against gentrification and displacement and, and how we can kind of think about this from an intersectional perspective with other issues and, and greater movement building. So anything, anybody who's interested in learning more about that or just kind of, you know, processing and thinking through um, how to be good funders, part, funding partners, um, I'm, I'm always happy to talk. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, uh, Gilda, a closing thought to share with the audience. Well, I just wanted to um, say how much I appreciated Alex and Don's um, presentations. I um, particularly um, appreciate, um, well, I've worked with Don for a long time, but Alex's um, assertion that the question isn't, you know, if gentrification and displacement are things that we need to deal with, but our question is how to do that. And um, once we um, get over that hump and focus on that together, I think our collective creative capacity will come up with many alternatives that um, are grounded in building resilience and protecting people from unnecessary suffering. It's amazing how many people cannot afford their housing, how important that is to the stability of their lives, of their family lives in our communities. And, um, we have to undo any tendency that there's something normal about that. And thank you very much for taking the time out of your day, all of you. Thank you, Gilda. Um, Dawn, uh, closing thoughts from you. Sure. Um, try to keep it quick. Um, echo the thanks, uh, Nancy, to you and your staff. And then um, it's always um, a great pleasure for me to get to 
work beside Alex and Gilda, um, I think the thing that I want to just leave folks with is how much tremendous opportunity there is right now. Um, you know, some of us have been doing housing work for a while now, and I think both Nancy and Gilda alluded to the historic nature of the moment that we are in um, around housing um, and what the potential to move the equity dial, the health dial, the build resilience long term, if we actually seriously, seriously, um, from the local to the national, take up this question of housing and what housing is doing or not doing in particular in low-income communities and communities of color and other vulnerable communities. Um, the good news for, for anyone who's a funder on the call, there's actually very little funding um, in, this, <laughs> in this area right now. The field is almost entirely wide open is the good news. Um, uh, is, is one of the few ways that this work is being funded and it re that really only occurs um, mostly in California. So. Um, I want to encourage folks to follow up to talk with me, Alex, and Gilda about the different, you know, Alex is, is working with funders, Gilda and I are working to, to write to the city, and I'm working here in the Bay, and um, there is such a, so much amazing work happening, inspiring work, work that is really, really making a difference in the lives of so many people, and um, I want to encourage anyone who's interested in finding out more about that work to please get a, get a hold of me. and and uh, please consider making an investment today in something that will really actually have tremendous impact. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Don. I, I, I just love the way you uh, created the silver lining of lack of funding. That's, that's perfect. That and, I, and I hope all the funders on the call um, um, hear that invitation to support um, this incredibly important but but also urgent work um, that that, that um, these people are doing. Um, so I want to thank today's speakers uh, for the work you do every day um, of the week and have done for so many years. Um, I know I know how hard it is. I've done it myself, and um, it's um, it, it's very encouraging to me to hear that. There is great opportunity now, um, after decades and decades of working on these issues, to see the hope in um, in your work and the opportunity to um, bring uh, bring greater equity to vulnerable populations. So, um, thank you all uh, for being on the webinar. And again, I want to remind you that our third and final webinar in the series on gentrification will be on May 18th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I do hope you can uh, join us there for a discussion um, about uh, some of the um, effective work that's being done in the country in addition to those we've heard from today. So thank you, and have a great day. <laughs>